Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning. We just thank you that we have the opportunity to worship you, that we can gather together, God. We just pray that everything that we do is, is done to glorify you. Help us have open hearts and open minds to what you're sharing through Pastor John this morning. We just lift up all those in our congregation that are in need, whether it's financial need, whether it's health-related need, whether they're going through hard times, God, we just pray that, that they see you and have your comfort through that. God, we pray that we can be your light in their lives as well as the lives of others around them. God, we just lift up those in uh, just all the different areas here, and whether it's in the police, whether it's in the, the fire, uh, fire safety things that are going on, God, we just pray for all the first responders. We lift them up to you for their safety. We also just pray for their families that they, they can have your comfort as they're out doing different things in our community. God, we just lift up the leadership at our church as well as just our little town here in Shippensburg and our state, the country, and the whole world. God, we know that you can lead and work through anyone. We just pray that your wisdom is going through all the leadership and that we, even in this church, are taking the steps that you want us to take. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Well, thank you for uh, attending this morning, being part of Prince Street Church, whether here physically in the sanctuary or watching online. Uh, this morning, what I want to do is to finish off our six-week series uh, sermon series called "The Deeply Formed Life." Uh, over the past month and a half, as a church, we have walked through a sermon series based off of the book "The Deeply Formed Life" by Rich Valotis. And, and there's a, a reason that we wanted to start this year in this way as a church, and it's because we, we sense God leading us to explore ways as a church and as individuals seeking to follow Jesus, how we might go about the, the work of deepening our relationship with Jesus and strengthening our souls. And this is why we began this six week, uh, this began this six weeks ago with this series. You know, right now we're in a unique season of history, and we want to be a church that meets this moment with a, a spiritual resolve that comes not from fading emotions, but through a steady diet of anchoring ourselves in spiritual disciplines that continue to renew our minds and refresh our souls and sustain us for the work that God has for us. How, however, as we have continued to say over these last few weeks, we don't just drift into trusting Jesus more deeply and more fully. There is often a rhythm to growing and trusting in Jesus. There's a cadence, a discipline to regularly daily returning to God and returning to God's word and God's work in our lives and God's work here in our community. Again, just to remind our the goal of this series is for us to experience internal growth through five transformative values that can lead us to a, deep, a deeper faith in Jesus. And we want to develop deeply formed lives. Lives that are deeply formed by the work of the Holy Spirit. We will not be shaped just because we did a sermon series on this either. This work of being deeply formed, this necessity of being continually shaped and sustained by God, it must be ongoing. So we need to keep pursuing this even when this series is over. We need to be willing to do the hard work of putting practices into place that will help us to be connected to the one that can help us grow deeply. 
we need to keep at it. Because we need to re- be reminded that is our desire that we would have together a deeply formed life that reflects a deeply formed faith and a deeply loving God for the sake of this deeply wonderful world. And this is why we're doing this series. It's not just about us, but it's in order for us to make an impact with the world that's around us. But we won't get there by half-stepping or shallow living and a superficial part-time faith. And no, look, I, I'm not saying that this is all on us to get done, of living in the, this vision of God's kingdom for our lives and for our world. It's absolutely a work of the Spirit, for sure. But God, in his wisdom, says that it won't happen, you know, God's kingdom coming down here to earth without us. It's an invitation that he extends to us. So it's our desire to see the Spirit move in, uh, in us and among us in power and tenderness is why we're doing this series. For us to join with the Spirit in cultivating that in our lives and in our community, even as we pray for and labor for what, what God really wants to do here in this community around us. And that's, that's how we got here. Well, this week, to finish off this series, we want to turn our attention to the value of missional presence. And, you know, missional presence can sound kind of like, you know, churchy jargon, but what it is at the heart of this phrase is the notion that we are called to be participants in God's work in the world. And we are called to be participants in God's work in this world. That we have a role in telling the tales of God's past activities in history, you know, most notably the story of Jesus, and also being bearers of the news of how God is working today. Now I want to just address a challenge to this phrase that we can encounter. You know, our, our tendency when we hear the word missional or mission is that we tend to think of words such as missionary or, or a mission trip. We tend to think of going somewhere else, especially a foreign country, either long-term like a missionary or short-term like on a mission trip. And when we hear of missional or missions, thinking that's where our brains tend to go. When we, uh, when we think of these things, again, both of these things are great, missionaries and mission trips. Again, we here, here at Prince Street support several missionaries who are doing great work for the kingdom all over the world. They're doing amazing things in the name of Jesus. We also support going on mission trips, whether it be dom- domestic or international, whether it be student or adult. And these trips can be used to transform our own lives as well as make an impact in the lives of the people that we minister to. Yet when we think of being missional in terms like that, you know, our, our tendency is to think of it as being something, you know, I do once, maybe back when I was in high school or once a year, like on an annual trip, or even that's what something someone else is called to do. Someone else is called to be a missionary, to go somewhere else and to share the good news of Jesus with those in a different country. That's not something for me. That's not something I I am called to do. Yet, when we speak of missional presence, we don't mean going on a trip or being called to go to another country for a long-term deal. What we mean by missional presence is actually a more radical, more rooted, more in line with the original understanding of the word mission. And what I mean by this phrase, this missional presence, I think is found in our, pa- or our passage this morning of John 20, verses 19 through 23. And so feel free to turn there in your Bibles, or of course you can pull out your smartphones, or of course also turn your attention to the screens as right there for us as well. But we're going to look at the passage of John 20, uh, verses 19 through 23, uh, together this morning. So starting with verse 19, it says, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And word of the Lord. 
In John 20, verses 19 through 23, Jesus is giving instructions to his disciples. The scene in John 20, Jesus has just been resurrected. You know, this is right after his death and burial, and actually it's just the same evening of his resurrection. And you know, the disciples, they don't all know that Jesus has been raised to life. And they still believe that he is dead, and they are crowded in fear in a locked second-story room in Jerusalem. And in John 20, verse 19, the resurrected Jesus miraculously appears to the disciples in this locked room. He comes to them in the midst of their fear, in the wake of their viewing of their Messiah's murder, and he says to them in verse 19, peace be with you. And it says in the verse, on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. The passage goes on to say the disciples were, were filled with joy when they saw Jesus, and Jesus greets them again with that same phrase, peace be with you. But then when he says the second time, the second phrase, um, again, when he says right afterwards is what I want to settle on for a, a moment this morning. He looks at these disciples who are just sort of wowed with this miraculous vision of Jesus phasing into the room, and in verse 21, Jesus again says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. He says to them, listen, peace, calm down. I am here. Everything is okay. But also, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. At this moment, at this very moment, Jesus is continuing to impress upon the disciples that they are a sent people. They are those that are not simply just to gather together for themselves, and they aren't simply to be those that know Jesus and live lives disengaged from the, the expanding nature of God's kingdom. They are those that have received something from God and are sent out to proclaim and display the reality of that message that they have received. We see this again and again in the New Testament. We see this cascading and radiating nature of God's sending. Jesus says, as God the Father has sent me, he's beginning to kind of articulate what the theologians throughout the ages have referred to as this Trinitarian understanding of God's sending. We see this throughout the, the Gospels, that God the Father sends Jesus the Son into the world to seek and save those that are lost. We see that in Luke 10. We see the, the Father sends the Son to proclaim the good news to the poor in Luke 4. The Father then sends the Son to announce the kingdom of God is here and at hand in Matthew 3, Matthew 5, and Mark 1. Again, the God the Father sent the Son. And now in John 20, Jesus is saying, just as God the Father sent me, now I am sending you. But Jesus is not sending them alone. In a few chapters prior in John 14, Jesus told them that he was going to send the Holy Spirit who would go with them. In Acts chapter 1, we begin to see what is going to happen with the Spirit that Jesus sends. We're going to see what happens when that Spirit takes residence in the lives of those Jesus were sending. That they would be witnesses. That they would be those that would give testimony to. They would be ones that would attest to the things that they have seen and had heard, that they experienced and had been a part of with Jesus. We see in Acts, verse, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But you, the disciples, will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What he is saying is that you will be my witnesses, and start where you are at, and will radiate out until it eventually blankets the planet. You know, throughout the Bible, God is ascending God. That God the Father sends the Son, the Son sends the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit empowers the sent people of God. And that's what we see time and time again in Scripture. So when Jesus enters the room filled with fearful disciples and says to them, just as the Father has sent me, so now I'm sending you, there are just a few things, that, a few turns of phrases that are important for us here to help us to walk through what this means a bit. First, I want to just point your attention to the verb tense that Jesus uses here. Again, I'm getting a little nerdy here, but so hang with me. But 
the verb tense that Jesus uses here is the, in the original language has sent is a verb tense that is describing something from the past that has present continuation. It's similar to say if uh, were to say if Amanda and I, my wife, and I were married back in 2015. It's an act that took place in the past but has present continuation. We were married in the past and has been and we have been married throughout and are married right now in past with present continuation. In essence, what Jesus is saying is that God has sent Jesus a son and continues to send Jesus. Jesus just wasn't simply sent at one point in the past in history. He was sent and is continually being sent. However, what Jesus is noting that the form of that sentness is now changing. Now that sending is through the disciples. Those in that locked room in Jerusalem. And those even in this room here at Prince Street. And those of you in whatever room you're watching online in your house. Jesus continues to be sent. But now that is through us. And now it is through you. Let me say that again. Jesus continues to be sent to this world. But now that is through us. And now it is through you. Second note to make is that actually the word for sent. Again, just, just as Jesus has sent me, so I send you. So again, the New Testament was written in an ancient version of Greek so that what we have is a translation from that original language. The Greek word for sent is this word apostolo. Now it is a word that we transliterate into English as apostle, which simply means a sent one, one who is sent. At the root of that word, it means one who is sent. And when the Greek version of the New Testament was translated into Latin, which is one of the first languages that the New Testament was translated into, this apostolo in Latin is this word missio, which means to send or to dispatch. Missio is where we get the English word mission. Now I tell you all this to say that when we talk about missional presence, what we are meaning, meaning is that we are to live as those who stand in the sent tradition of God, who sent the Son who sent the Spirit, who now empowers us as the sent people of God to proclaim and display the good news of God's kingdom. You know, Prince Street Church, we are a sent people. We are a community on mission, right? Meaning that we are those sent for a purpose in the same way that Jesus our Lord our and Savior was sent. And we are are a sent people. We are a community on mission. What Jesus wants to say to you and what he wants to say to me now on this 28th day of February is the same thing that Jesus said to those first apostles, the first sent ones. Just as I was sent, even so I am sending you. We are sent ones. We are meant to share the good news of Jesus with our community around us. So what does it mean for us to be sent ones? I think an important question for us to ask is, how did the Father send the Son? What were some of the characteristics that the Father sent the Son in? What are the, some of the defining characteristics of how Jesus was sent? Again, there's a lot. There's a lot of truth, a lot of number of virtues, and a whole host of characteristics and marks that we can look at. We can note that Jesus was sent in humility and he was sent in obscurity. We can note that Jesus was sent in power with the announcements of the angels, the shepherds watching over flocks of sheep. We can note that Jesus was sent in poverty and, and of power, of powerlessness. Or we can reflect on Jesus being sent in the company of others who were in community and ministered with him. All those and so many others, they're all worthy of their own sermons and their own series. But the two I want us to remember this morning is that Jesus was sent in love and that Jesus was sent in person. And Jesus was sent in love and Jesus was sent in person. And how, how did the Father send the Son? Well, John's gospel tells us clearly in John chapter 3, again, this very famous verse, verses in 3, 16 through 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, 
that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send, you know, Apostolo or Armisio, his son, into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God so loved the world that he sent, that he Apostolo, that he missioned his son. And our engagement in the world, our joining of God's kingdom and his expanding work that's around us, it must be motivated by love. God's love towards us and God's love toward the world that he created. Any of our work for justice must be motivated by love. Our acts of compassion and making things right must be motivated and animated by God's love. If our care for those that are in poverty does not reflect God's love, if our advocacy for people in need does not point to God's great love, if our preaching and praying does not sound like a God who loves, well, the Bible tells us that we are just a clanging cymbal and a noisy gong. In Prince Street Church, we, as we serve in the many areas of mission that we do here, we do so because we are sent. Because we are sent to our community as ambassadors carrying God's love and God's message of love displayed in Christ. And that's why we do these things, right? That has to be the motivator behind all this that we do. God sends the Son by the way of love, and God sends us by the way of love, too. But he also sent the Son in person. And Jesus was incarnated, flesh and blood, skin and bones, present in mind and in body. Jesus didn't just love from a distance, and neither should we. You see, our place matters where we're at. Since Jesus took on flesh and blood, lived in a neighborhood, and identified with the people, we also need to root ourselves in our community and identify with people. Our place is in Shippensburg, PA, and we want to be among those that love this community and love this community well. Again, we are called to be a, a people collectively and individually to embody this sentness, to be a people of presence, to not only love, but to actually be in amongst the people that we love. Again, over this past year, with everything that's going on, this calling for us to be connected with people, to be a people of presence, has been hard, hasn't it? I'll be honest, it's been challenging. And if you're anything like me, you have gotten out of this practice of connecting with people and being a real present with the people that we love and care for. And of course, we know the pandemic is a big part of that, and we can't downplay its effects of hindering our ability to be physically present with people, which again, is completely understandable, and there's a, a rightness to that to some degree. But we still need to remember that we are sent people. We still need to remember that we are sent people. We are not meant to be stuck in our own lives, but to be sent to this community in the name of Jesus. So we need to consider imaginative ways that we can continue to embody our faith and display our faith and proclaim our faith using all the creativity and imagination and technology and even old school forms such as, you know, even front porch mask wearing hospitality that we can conceive of for the sake of the gospel and for the world. Maybe just to close up, we just need to consider the ways that we can begin taking steps towards displaying this missional presence of God. Joining in the work of proclaiming God's love through our presence, through our hospitality, our acts of kindness, our compassion, our justice. Everything that we do, acts that ultimately point to the one that saves us. In just a few moments, we're going to have a time where you can actually come to the altar. A time where you can come up to the altar, receive prayer, and you can come up to the altar and receive prayer for any number of reasons. One, you might be thinking, you know, I've been doing this Jesus thing for a long time. I've been following Jesus for a while now in my life, but I've forgotten that I am someone who's supposed to be sent by God to share his good news to those around me. 
that I've been doing the Christian thing of coming to church and going to Sunday school and singing worship songs, but I've forgotten the fact that after I leave here on a Sunday morning, that I'm called to be on mission for God. Or maybe you'll come up to the altar because after this last year that you've gotten away from being present in people's lives and being present with God's presence with people. And you, you need to be challenged to get back out there and be with people, whether either, either physically or even digitally or, or whatever, and show God's love to them. So this morning, you might want to come to the altar and say, God, I want to be on mission for you. I want to live as a sent person. God, please use me to make a difference in your kingdom today. And that could be one reason you could come to the altar this morning. Or you just might be tired of living a life for Jesus that is just shallowly formed. You're tired of being more formed by the culture that is around you or a faith that is more focused on doing the right things instead of having that intimate, deep relationship with the Creator. So you might come to the altar this morning to ask God to help you to change the shallow rhythms in your life and to add practices in that can help you to be deeply formed by and for Jesus. Or this morning, you might be saying, you know, I don't really have a relationship with Jesus that you're talking about. You know, I've been living with a life uh, with him. Uh, again, I've been living a life with him not being the focus of my life, and I desire to have a relationship with him. I desire to have the Holy Spirit dwell inside of me. I desire to have a purpose in my life that is greater than myself and one where God can use me to do great things. So you may come to the altar this morning saying, God, I want to know you. I want to begin a relationship with you this morning. Or finally, you may come to the altar this morning just because you need prayer. There's a, a lot going on in your life and you need a pastor to pray for you. You have something going on, maybe physically or emotionally or relationally or, or spiritually, and you just need someone to pray for you. Or maybe you have a friend or a family member that needs to be lifted up in prayer this morning. So you might want to come to the altar this morning to have someone pray for you. So just in a few seconds, we're going to have some soft music playing in the background, and we just want to give you some time to come forward, to, to kneel at the, one of our altars, and receive prayer for one of these things that I just mentioned. And Pastor Seth and I will be available to pray for you for whatever reason you're coming to the front this morning. So please, if God is calling you, please come to the altar this morning.
church, will you join me in prayer? God, we gather together to remember your word and your promises to us. We gather to consider rightly this invitation to us. We gather to wrestle with notion that we are a people who are sent just as you sent your son. God, I pray that even as we reflect on John 20, that it would crash into our souls and would trigger thoughts for us on how we are to embody your love, proclaim your love, and display your love to our, our neighbors that, uh, and to those that are just right around us. However we, can, we can do that, however we can love our neighbors, however we can love those right around us, ways that are faithful. God, I pray that we would be courageous in doing so, not out of our own strength, not out of our own fear, but sustained by the power of the Holy Spirit that comes on us, that joins us in our sentness and in our sending. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.